Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today we're taking a look at some $600 to $700 IEMs, sort of. And let me explain that by introducing what we're looking at. Starting at the top of the range, we've got the Meza Adva IEMs. These are a new IEM from Meza Audio. And they're a 699 US dollar single dynamic driver, beautifully made IEM. They've got a wonderful look and feel to them. They've got these amazing stainless steel housings that are just beautifully molded and shaped. The engineering is absolutely fantastic. As always with Meza Audio products, there are these little tiny details for you to take in and absorb with these earphones. Things like the tiny printing around the vent on the front of each IEM or the back, depending on how you look at it. And then also the details around the MMCX connector. Everything is just spectacular about these. They also come with a really high quality cable and really high quality final audio E-type tips. And so they're the top of the tree in terms of price in the three we're looking at today. In addition to those over here, we've got the Fio FH9. These come in at 600 US dollars. And these again are also beautifully made and beautifully finished. They come in this beautiful leather carry case. And then inside you've got a wonderful high quality woven cable that's quite thick, but not too thick. And again, some beautiful metal housing IEMs that are very, very nice to behold and also to wear. The FH9s are a hybrid approach using a single dynamic driver and six balanced armatures per side in an interesting semi-open design. Now that doesn't mean that they don't isolate well or they leak lots of sound, it's just designed to give a little bit less sense of closed inness, if you like, when listening to them. I'll come back around and talk about something else that makes these unique shortly, but in putting them up against the Meza Advar, despite being a more traditional looking IEM being the FH9s, I think they equally as well represent the sort of feel and look and comfort that you expect for a $600 IEM. And so putting these down, let's have a look at the outlier in this mix. The final IEM I've got here is the Hyferman RE800. And the reason these are an outlier is they've got a list price of $599 US dollars. But at the time that I wrote this review, and indeed when I looked at them beforehand, they're being sold for a much, much lower price. At the time I wrote my notes, these are listed for just $99 US dollars. And yet apparently they've got a list price of $599. When I planned this review and put these three together, I did so based entirely on the list price. And so when it came to actually producing it, doing my notes, etc., I decided to keep them in here and see if they can actually stack up against earphones that are worth around the same price, and in both cases here, a little bit more than the RE800. To introduce the RE800 though, it's a single dynamic driver earphone with a very, very compact shell. It's only just big enough to fit the driver inside. And then they're attached to a very basic but decent quality cable, albeit a fixed cable, so you can't change these should there be any issues. And then on top of that, you've got a very basic set of accessories. The range of tips is exceptional with lots of different single and double flange options. But beyond that, they're a very basic earphone and therefore the accessory and packaging and even the look and feel of them is probably more akin to a $99 earphone than it is to a six or $700 one. And so the big questions for me for this review are whether or not the RE800 should actually be priced at closer to $600. And then which of these three I think are the best sounding and best value for money IEMs. Before I get into the sound quality discussions, I just want to quickly revisit each of the earphones because each of them has its own benefits, features, drawbacks, etc. So I just want to quickly touch on some of those that I didn't mention in the opening. And I'm going to start again with the RE800s. I've already mentioned they've got non-detachable cables, and I know that for some people that's an instant no-no. If you're someone that tends to break cables, these aren't a good option because you can't change the cable. Something else that's worth mentioning about the RE800s are these. These are ear hooks. So the idea is you can put these around the cable of the IEM and help it to go up and over the ear. 
But honestly, I can't imagine anyone being particularly comfortable wearing these. They look and feel pretty plasticky and hard. They're not something I'd ever want to wear. And I think high men are probably better off not even bothering with these. If you've used them before and you think they work better than I do, leave a comment down below. But I think these are a bit of a travesty and that's why I poked fun at them a bit in the Glamour video. So putting these aside, we're now going to talk about what else there is about the RE800 that makes them a bit unique and different. And part of that is their tiny, tiny form factor. Once you put these things in your ears, they absolutely disappear. Between the range of different ear tips available, which is huge and it's incredible just how many they come with, between the range of those ear tips and the physical size of the RE800, they're an excellent and comfortable IEM once you pop them in your ear. I'm not normally a fan of straight in style designs, but these are so compact that they kind of go against that trend. On the flip side of that though, it is worth noting that without those horrendous ear tips that I just threw on the floor, these are really a downward cable IEM. What I mean by that is that when you want to put them in, they're going to run down like so, rather than having the cable go up and over the ear, because that's where those horrible ear clips come into play. So these are definitely, in my opinion, a downward cable IEM. For some people that's an issue, for some it's not. It does mean they're more prone to microphonics, and this cable is not particularly good at avoiding that. But in my listening, it caused no problems. They're just an IEM I would tend to use when I was stationary, sitting at a desk, laying in bed, that sort of thing, rather than out and about and on the go. I think definitely for mobile use, if you are out and about, an over-ear design is generally a better choice. One other feature that the RE800s apparently have going for them is that they use Hyferman's topology diaphragm. The idea of this diaphragm and this technology is used in multiple Hyferman products, including the recently reviewed HER9s. This diaphragm is made up of multiple different densities, thicknesses, different types of materials across the surface of the whole driver. And the idea is that it better allows Hyferman to control the resonances, the damping, the general performance of the driver at all different frequencies. I've sometimes spoken in the past about the fact that every manufacturer has their own story about why their technology is unique, so I don't get too hung up on it, but I was interested to see just how well this performed when it's such a cheap, such a compact IEM up against some of these others here. And so with that in mind, the one final thing I want to mention before we talk about the other two is that the RE800 is a 60 ohm, 105 decibel sensitivity IEM. And what that means is that they're pretty easy to drive. They're not going to take very much juice at all. You can run them from a phone, a dongle, a desktop system, whatever you like. And indeed, all of the IEMs in this roundup are pretty straightforward. The FH9 has the lowest impedance at 18 ohms, which is still not that low for an IEM. And they're all 105 decibel sensitivity or higher. And basically, once you get over 100 decibels of sensitivity, you know that pretty much anything is going to be able to drive it. If you're not familiar with sensitivity numbers, the way they work is that the number of sensitivity, so let's say it's 100 decibels, the 100 decibel sensitivity means that from one milliwatt of power, you're going to get 100 decibels of output. Now, this is different from speakers where they're normally measured in watts. So in the world of earphones, they're measured in milliwatts. And so, as I said before, if you can get 100 decibels from just one milliwatt, you've got no problems driving them from anything at all. Of course, quality of power is still going to matter, but the amount of power available is completely irrelevant. And so let's now talk about some of the features of the Meza Advar, and I'm choosing those because there's not too many to talk about. They're beautifully designed, the housings have got this wonderful shape to them, and a beautiful fit and finish. But beyond that, there's not a huge amount of features or benefits to talk about. They are designed in such a way that they support the use of an over ear cable, so that's really good if you're looking for out and about use and at reducing microphonics. Microphonics being the sound that carry up the cable if it gets bumped or it drags against your clothing. But beyond a beautiful design and really high quality accessories, there's really not much to say about the Advars. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but like the RE800, they also use a single dynamic driver, and so they're fairly comparable to the RE800 in that regard. Both are wonderfully comfortable, albeit with very different form factors, and both are single dynamic drivers. And so the odd IEM out here in terms of its design of drivers and driver count is definitely the FH9. As I mentioned before, the FH9 is a single dynamic driver and six balanced armature unit. What makes it even more unique though, is these little tuning nozzles. So when you open up the box of the FH9, you get this little metal card. Sitting in the metal card are two different sets of nozzles and there is a third one already attached to the IEMs. What that allows you to do is tune the output of the IEMs to go from a bass oriented sound through to a balanced sound and through to a treble sound. They come in a balanced setup, but it's very easy just to screw on and screw off these little nozzles. As far as I can tell, what these nozzles are doing is applying different amounts of damping to the treble, whilst leaving the actual bass output pretty much untouched. 
In case that's not enough tuning and customization for you though, Fio have also provided another amazing set of tips. It's probably even more amazing to be honest than the RE800s because you've got different styles, both in terms of foam and rubber, but then different brands of rubber, or actually I think it's silicon. So there's some spin fit tips in there. There's different tuning styles. So you've got open bore and closed bore tips that allow you to have more or less bass and treble. So there's a huge amount of customization available from the FH9. Now that poses some challenges for me as a reviewer to tell you everything they're capable of but hopefully in a moment I can give you some sense of what they're able to do. As you look through Fio's website and read about the FH9s, it also appears that they've done a huge amount of very careful engineering inside the shells of the IEMs, and that's to make sure that the base driver and the balanced armatures all work really well together. One of the challenges when we have multi-driver IEMs is that they don't always come together in a coherent single presentation. You can get some frequencies over enhanced, you can get issues where placement of sounds can be a bit off, and so that's what the engineers at FIO were obviously trying to avoid, and I'll get to it in a moment as to whether I think they succeeded. To get us there though, we're going to have to talk about the sound quality of each of these, and in order to do this test effectively with three different IEMs, I've done it a bit differently to many of my reviews. And that is that I've just moved through a number of different tracks and talked about what I've heard from each IEM across those tracks. All of the testing was done with the exact same setup, and that is that I was using a Mojo 2 with the Chord Poly. There was no EQ or crossfeed being used, so everything was on dead flat, dead neutral, no alterations to the sound. And because there's such a vast range of tips available here, I actually chose to stick with a single set of tips for all testing. And that happened to be a set of Final Audio E-Type tips, not because that's what comes with the ADVAR, but because they're one of my preferred favorite tip types. I often get asked for recommendations on the channel for specific products at specific price points. And so what I've done to help is produce this database. If you take a look at the description box in any of my videos, you'll find a section that says Passion for Sound Recommends. You might need to click the more button to see it, but it's always in the description. Clicking on the Passion for Sounds Recommends link will take you through to this database and give you a chance to see all of the different products that I've recommended over the years. The Airtable database contains a heap of information, but so that it's not overwhelming, I've set it up in such a way that you can filter it to look at just the sorts of products you're looking for. Let's say you're looking for a headphone, you can select that in the filter list and see all of the headphones that I recommend ordered by price from lowest to highest. You can also use the filter and sort buttons in different ways to better suit your searching needs, so feel free to play around with it as much as you like, it won't affect what other people can see. The idea was to make a resource for you that allows you to quickly and easily find the types of products at the budget that you're looking for. Once you've found products that you're interested in, you'll also notice that there's links next to each of the products that will take you to various retailers and manufacturers. So you might find links to places like Appos Audio in USA and Canada, or Amazon links to the USA, Australia, Canada, and the UK, or global links to places like Mastrop, Linsol, HiFiGo, or the manufacturers themselves such as Viram Audio, Gishelli Labs, and ZMF Headphones. Some of these links are affiliate links, but certainly not all of them, and it's definitely not a criteria to get on this list. These are just products that I recommend, and whilst your support via affiliate links is always appreciated, it's absolutely not expected, and also does not influence whether a product makes it onto this list. The list is always evolving, growing, and changing, so do check back regularly if you're looking for something new, and I hope you find this a useful resource. For now though, let's get back to the review. As I talk through what I heard, I'll also show you some measurements on screen, but as always, take the measurements with a pinch of salt because they're taken on a non-professional measurement rig, and it is also worth remembering that you should never compare any test results from one person to those taken by somebody else, because the test rig could be different, the compensation curve could be different, there are lots of different factors that change how you can compare them. So these are really just measurements to help you compare the three IEMs that I've got on the table in front of me, rather than comparing them to other IEMs that other people have measured. And so with that in mind, let's dive into our first track, which is Searching For My Love by Robert Plant and Alison Krauss. I began my listening with the FH9 using the balanced nozzles for this test, and what I noticed straight away was a very balanced tonality overall. And I don't say that just because it was using the balanced tips or nozzles, it's just that they do happen to provide a very balanced tonality. And that's pretty true regardless of which nozzle you use. There's a tambourine in this recording, and it's got a nice sense of clarity and sparkle when using the FH9s. It doesn't come too far forward in the mix, but it's definitely present and you do notice it. More importantly though, is the vocals have a good sense of presence, and they're really well placed both in terms of how obvious and present they are in the mix, but also it's really well focused in the overall soundstage and the image. The bass has a good sense of presence, but it's not overdone in any way from the FH9s, it's just again very well balanced with everything else in the mix. 
as I listened to the FH9s and some of the other IMs in this review, I did notice that the FH9s push the 2 kHz range just forward a little bit, and that's sometimes referred to as the presence region. It can give an extra sense of clarity and energy to vocals, and it's done quite well in the FH9s in that it doesn't overdo it, but it's clearly done differently and with a bit more emphasis than it is on the other two IMs, being the Advar and the RE800. I'm not going to say if that's better or worse because it's generally pretty preferential. And so instead of that, I'm going to move on now and tell you how the Meza Advars compare to the FH9s. Still listening to the same track, of course. And then moving over to the Advars, what I immediately noticed was a greater sense of space. These produce a larger overall soundstage with more space between each instrument, but they also have a brighter tonality overall. The Advars tilt the emphasis more towards that tambourine that I mentioned before, and they take some of the weight away from the vocals. They're still a generally musical and enjoyable IEM that's engaging, but I can see the Advars becoming a little bit fatiguing on some sources and some tracks for certain people. And indeed, what I'm hearing from the Advars reminds me a bit of what I heard from the Prototype 109 Pro headphones that I was able to hear recently, also from Meza Audio, and that is that Meza Audio seem to be leaning towards tuning their headphones with a bit of a treble spike emphasis. And it's not necessarily a trend that I'm a huge fan of. I think on first listen it can make it sound spacious and detailed and provide a sense of clarity, but on longer term listening and with lesser quality recordings, it can sometimes bite. And certainly with the Advars, they can be magical sometimes, but also they can get just a tiny bit edgy sometimes too. With the RE800, keeping in mind this is actually selling for 99 US dollars, the RE800 had easily the largest sense of space of any of these three. It throws a beautiful large soundstage, still for an IEM, it's not going to compete with big headphones, but for these three IEMs, it was the largest and most spacious sounding IEM. What that also means is that it separates the sounds beautifully. You can easily hear where everything's placed in the mix from the very cheaply priced RE800. Its tonality is probably closer to the Advar than it is to the FH9 because it also has a bit of treble emphasis, but I feel like the spike on the RE800 is better placed, at least for my ears, and that's worth keeping in mind too, is that we all have different sensitivities, different resonances of our ear canals. And for me, the RE800 definitely hits the mark just a bit better than the Advar does. It brings that sense of clarity and spaciousness from the treble without ever getting quite as harsh as I occasionally found the Advar. And I should make it clear, the Advar is not a harsh IEM, but it does just walk that fine line of occasionally having too much emphasis at that particular point in the treble. In comparison with all three IEMs, I think the RE800 probably still has just a tiny bit too much treble from a completely natural and accurate point of view. And it does mean that the FH9 for me is the most natural and organic or realistic sounding IEM of the three, but all of them are actually very, very enjoyable. And indeed at this point, after listening to all three, I don't think I would say that one is better than the other, I think they're all quite different. But one track is never enough to know which IEM is best, and so I did listen to a lot more different tracks. And one of those was Too Afraid by Marina. Starting with the RE800, the first thing I noticed was there's a wonderful sense of depth to the bass. There's no overemphasis, but it's really present, really well extended, and very, very well controlled. Marina's vocal is smooth and textured, it's got a really nice quality to it, but I did find that the electronic snare used in this track does come across just a little bit harsh from the RE800. Again, that's the trade-off of these treble spikes that a lot of IEM designers like to use, is it produces that sense of clarity, but if you get the wrong track where there's also an emphasis in the track, those treble spikes can go too far. And I think that's what's going on with the RE800 on this particular track. Putting that aside for a moment, I do want to mention again that the sense of space and soundstage and separation of sounds from the RE800 is once again top notch, in this price range at least. It's an excellent presentation of all the different sounds in this mix. And then one other thing that I really enjoy from the RE800s is there's a real tactile sense to the sound. It's got a sense of energy and attack at the front end of notes, all the way from the bass notes through to the treble, so this is not just about that treble spike. It's about the way the driver is delivering the attack of each note, having the right amount of decay and presence, so every note has weight to it, but it's also got speed to it as well. And so I really like the RE800 from all those points of view. I just wish that treble was tamed ever so slightly on certain tracks. And that's where a different choice of tips could actually help. The sheer range of variability that tip selection can make to an IEM is way too much for me to cover, particularly when I'm looking at three different IEMs. So I'm probably going to leave any sort of tip rolling and choosing the right tips up to you because your ear anatomy is also different to me. So what works for me may not work so well for you. And what I'd encourage is that if you're interested in any of these IEMs, 
to then try a bunch of different tips and work out which one tunes them to be just right for you. But certainly the RE800 has a really nice foundation to build upon. It's probably worth mentioning that if you are interested in tip rolling, I've got a dedicated video that I did some time ago now that talks about how tips influence the sound and how to predict what tip is likely to do what for you. So check that one out if you're interested. I'll try to remember to put a card here when I do the production and the upload of this video. But if I happen to forget, just search Passion for Sound Tip Rolling and it should come up in your search results. For now though, let's switch back over to the FH9 and see how it performed on Too Afraid by Marina. The most obvious change going from the RE800 to the FH9 on this track was it brought the vocal from being probably just outside the head on the RE800 to being just inside the head on the FH9. The soundstage is all smaller from the FH9 but it's still got an excellent sense of separation, albeit within a small space. So there's not quite as much projection forwards, but there's a good sense of left-right width and a nice sense of separation of each individual sound. Something else I noticed from the FH9 is the bass is less obvious and present. It's not that it's lacking, the FH9's got a good sense of bass overall, but its bass is very smooth. It doesn't have that tactile kind of punch that the RE800 does, and that's probably a slight shortcoming of the FH9 for me. I thought this was a good chance to test those bass nozzles to see if I could tune the bass to be a bit more like the RE800, and in changing from the balanced nozzles to the bass nozzles, I did prefer the sound that resulted because it brought the vocals more into focus. And that's because what those bass nozzles are doing is they're not changing the bass at all, they're actually just attenuating some of the treble. And I personally think it's bringing it closer to a truly flat response and therefore gives you a more accurate representation of all the frequencies in the mix. And so the end result using the bass nozzles on the FH9s, still with the same final audio tip that I've used for everything else, is that I feel like the FH9s probably have the best overall balance of tonality, and particularly when using that bass nozzle, but they never quite capture that tactile nature that the RE800s have. And that's something I really, really enjoy about the RE800s. They bring a sense of energy and liveliness to the music, not through tricks of frequency response, but just a beautifully controlled driver. I have a feeling that some of the ducting and porting of the bass driver in the FH9 is actually robbing some of the immediacy from the driver. It doesn't sound bad by any stretch, I really like the FH9s as I'll talk about at the end, but I do think they lack just a slight sense of energy and attack that some people are going to want. The result instead is a wonderfully smooth, very easy to listen to, musical and detailed experience, but they don't bring that sense of energy that sometimes I find I want. And so I put down the FH9s at this point to see if the Advars could bring more of that tactile nature. And still listening to Too Afraid by Marina, what I heard from the Advars was a beautiful sense of clarity in the vocals. Once again moving to the Advars, I felt some of that tactility and energy come back into the sound. So the Advars performed more like the RE800s than they do the FH9s in terms of that bass energy, that punch, that sense of attack in notes, but again not from the treble so much as the speed and control of the driver. So I do think that the FH9 is being a little bit muted somehow by its internal design, but it's not to say it's bad, it's just a bit different, it's just a bit smoother overall, and some people will love that. Coming back to the Advar though again, and again I felt like the treble was just a bit over enhanced on this track. It does provide a wonderful sense of clarity and detail, but at the expense of being just a little bit too forward sometimes, and throwing off the overall tonal balance of the earphone just a little bit for me. Once again, I think some people are going to love the sound of the Advar, I certainly really like it, but in comparison with the other two, I think the tonality of the FH9 is better, and I think at their crazy cheap price, the RE800 is right there next to the Advar, and probably better in some ways. Not always, but in some ways, and enough that for the price tag, you could buy yourself three pairs of RE800s, so you've got backups if their cables fail, and you're still coming out way less than the Meza Advar. Now I want to be really clear here, I'm not knocking the Advar, I'm not saying it's not a wonderful IEM, it's beautifully designed and I think with maybe also a different choice of cable, it could be the best of these three. But if you're buying it straight out of the box, using it exactly as it is, I do think it's got just a slightly overemphasized treble and it just tilts it a bit too far in that direction, tonality wise, for my tastes. And so to bring all this to a close, let me give you my final thoughts, having spent lots of time with all three of these, trying a bunch of different tracks over and above what I've just talked about. Where it left me landing was that I think at $99, if that's the price they still are at the time of this review, or at the time you're watching this review, I think at $99, the RE800 is an absolute bargain. Now I wonder if they're a run out model at that sort of price, and therefore I'd say if you're thinking about it, 
go out and buy yourself a set straight away. But to think beyond the RA800s, I also think it's worth saying that all three of these are generally tonally pretty good. I do feel like the Advar and the RE800 tilt just a little bit too far into the treble, but it's very, very minor, and some people are going to love the fact that that bit of treble emphasis also brings a sense of clarity and detail to the mix. I personally find it slightly unnatural, but I know a lot of people love it. You've probably guessed from that then, that out of these three, my pick for the most natural and honest sounding IEM is definitely the FH9. I think they're a marvellous IEM from every aspect, the design, the accessories, and most importantly the sound, particularly because you can tune them so much with the included tips and the included nozzles. I do wish they had that slight more sense of energy and attack that the other two have, but if you were to ask me to choose one out of these three, it would be the FH9. To help you make a choice though, I was thinking about it in terms of which one suits different needs. And so let me run through a few situations or scenarios or preferences and tell you which IEM of these I would choose for each of those. Firstly, for vocal lovers, I think I'd probably go for either the FH9 if you want to have just the vocal, have a sense of lush, richness and focus, I think the FH9. If you're more someone that enjoys the air and the detail and texture in the vocals, then I think it's the Meza Advar. For overall tonal balance and I mean tonal accuracy and also a general sense of smoothness, then once again we come back to the FH9. But if you're more looking for dynamics and energy, then it's the Adva or the RE800. I think they're both roughly on par, and then it comes down to which tonality I've described that you prefer. Do you want a bit more sizzle and attack in the treble, then go for the Adva. Or if you want a slightly smoother sound, then it's probably the RE800. Finally, if soundstage is your number one priority, then absolutely the RE800 is the choice, with the Adva a very close second. The FH9 isn't bad for soundstage, and with the treble tip, it does open up a bit, but I think both the Adva and the RE800 have it beaten. One other IEM that's worth mentioning here, which I didn't have on hand to compare, but another IEM in this same sort of price range is the Shure EJ07M. I reviewed that recently, and I really, really enjoyed it, but it's a very different sounding IEM. It's got more of a sort of V-shaped tuning and a bit of a suck out in the mids, and so it's nowhere near as tonally accurate as any of these three, but at the same time, it's got a very fun and enjoyable sound signature. So whilst I can't compare them directly, what I'd say is if you're looking for something more accurate, more honest and true, one of these three is the better choice. If you're looking for pure fun and a bit of coloration, then the EJ07M is a good option, but do check out my review of that one because it's got a little bit of a flaw in that mid-range suck out that can throw off its tonality in much the same way that the treble throws off the tonality of the Advar and the RE800. So at the end of all this, we've got four different IEMs that are fantastic, that being the Shure, and then the three I've reviewed here. And honestly, I think you can't go wrong with any of those four. If any of these take your fancy, I'll find some links and put them down below so you can check out your purchase options there and pick up whichever one suits you. As always, I hope you found this review useful. If you have, I'd love it if you'd hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, ring the notification bell, and hit that like button too. I really appreciate the support as always, and it helps me to keep bringing content like this to you. So thanks for watching, but for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.